Hello and welcome to the fourth Orvis Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival here in the incredible waters around Chichester Harbour. From humble beginnings, this event has grown and has now become the biggest of its kind anywhere in the world. So why has this event grown to become such a fantastic thing? I think part of the reason, just have a little look around, this place is extraordinary, isn't it? We're at Church Norton, which has become almost the traditional place for the event to start every single year. But actually, what's happened this year is because the competition has grown so much, the fishing grounds have expanded. We've gone as far to the east of the region as we can to Bognor Regis but the competition grounds have expanded into Portsmouth. They've gone a long way further west and actually we've got more water than we've ever fished before and there are more anglers taking part. So it just goes to show that saltwater fly fishing is really on the rise. Now I'll tell you what else is on the rise. The tides this weekend are extraordinary. Look behind me, there's very little water. This is usually full of seawater. This is a lovely bay which will be full of mullet and bass in about an hour or two's time. And at the other end of the tide, the water will be five or six metres deep. It is extraordinary. You've never seen so much water in your life. Amazing, amazing stuff, which is gonna provide some huge challenges for the anglers taking part. Now, this is the second day of the competition. For the first time ever, we've been fishing on the Friday. So here is a little look back at what happened yesterday. So it's the first official day of the competition this year and we're joining the rest of the anglers wandering around in this incredible environment. You know, this is the first time it's ever been fished on the Friday, just demonstrating the fact that this event has now grown uh, beyond what anybody could have expected a few years ago when it started. Where we are today is a really interesting place, you know, and I suppose it illustrates a little bit about the diversity of different areas that we can now fish in this festival. So here we are on the very famous Oyster Beds Mark, just outside of Portsmouth. We've got Hailing Island over there, the city of Portsmouth over to my left-hand side. And it's that direction that the festival has expanded into this year. There's so many bits and pieces of really fascinating water, little tiny creeks, little rivulets, tiny bits and tiny areas that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find saltwater anglers casting flies. Now it remains to be seen of course where the fish are going to be caught this year. The oyster beds was fantastic last year, we'll see. There are a few anglers out on various different marks. The tide is high at the moment and it will ebb away very quickly because the tides this year are just extraordinary. While the festival itself is a competition, there's an awful lot of other stuff going on. Part of the reason it's grown to this size is the investment in sharing knowledge, passed on from those who've been doing this for a long time to those who want to experience life as a saltwater fly angler for the first time. So at 9am on Friday morning, Joe Walker was telling Taos about his experiences in saltwater. Soon followed by the mullet maestro himself, Colin McLeod. Then it was down to the beach at Eastney near Portsmouth for some of the anglers to wet a line in salt water for the very first time. Many of these anglers have only ever fished in fresh water before, so coaches and guides were on hand to steer them through the process. Everything from watercraft to how to tie knots that'll make sure you don't lose the fish of your dreams. As you've probably already gathered, saltwater fly fishing isn't easy. There's wind tide, there are tourists and tactics to conquer. It's a passion some people have embraced. There are some very serious competitors here, um, serious what I call trophy hunters, um, and they don't want to be here with me doing the beginner stuff, they want to be out chasing bass and they just love catching the big fish. On my level I'm hoping to see them improve their casting uh, safely, getting slightly longer distance and also I want to see them catching plenty of fish. And as a Cornishman by birth, you know, I love, I love the, the sea, so uh, I'm not in my element here. Yeah. 
going to be really interesting to see how many fish are caught this weekend and we have as i said three days ahead of us there have already been a few bass landed though this year the competitors have been busy with their phone cameras providing an angler's eye view of the action on the water here's a selection of what they saw on day one dan wilcox managed to film himself landing this 35 centimeter bass just a few yards from where i was standing at the oyster beds a great way to get off the mark the fish steadily started to get bigger as the tide grew though here's a fish landed by paul jennings which measured 40 centimeters Alan Robertson went bigger still with a 41, and then Lewis Clark with a 43. This is a catch and release competition, so everything captured went back into the sea. Nick Toon landed the first fish to go over the magic 50 centimetre mark with this 51. So it's great to see one or two decent fish are being caught despite the size of the tide. A few fish coming out on those open beach areas down that way. And remember, the highest tide for 18 years. I mean, that's the most incredible thing of all, isn't it? Now, that does pose a few problems, but it also creates a few interesting scenarios, which is why I'm here. If you look around me, there are loads of birds working. We've seen lots of little tiny bait fish. We are way up river. We're miles from the sea, about five or six miles from the actual seafront. And the festival actually takes into account this type of area, these estuarine areas where you know it's tidal, the tide comes in and out, there's loads of seagrass, really fascinating places. Now, one of the most interesting things I've learned the last 12 months or so, where I've been doing a little bit of this type of fishing, is that decent sized bass do come up into this sort of water. You know, there are some serious, serious fish that go into some crazy shallow water. So I'm gonna have a little cast, see if I can get a fish to show you. We've only got an hour left of the competition today, and then we'll get back to headquarters and see what's going on. Just having a few last casts, it's a couple of minutes to five. Talking about tides, we got here an hour ago and you saw what it was like, you know, the water was up to here. And in an hour, the opposite side of a massive high tide, which has been over five meters today, extraordinary stuff, is that you get an incredible low. And actually, if we stood here and waited for another half an hour, this would be completely dry. So it's gone from kind of massively deep to impossibly shallow. And this is the challenge that a lot of the anglers are gonna face this entire weekend here in Chichester Harbour and over in Portsmouth Harbour. It really is gonna be interesting to see what happens. Tomorrow morning, I fancy we're gonna head down to Church Norton, which is one of the favorite locations for all the anglers to go, because as well as fishing for bass, which is what I've been doing this afternoon, with limited success, one little tiny one, and one slightly interesting risey thing, which could have been a fish, we're going to head and try and catch some mullet. Mullet, the ultimate enigma when you're fly fishing in salt water, great fun. In the meantime, let's get back to headquarters and see how the rest of the guys have done on the first day of the festival. All the competitors returned to hand in their scorecards. As usual, with big groups of anglers, there were more fish caught and lost in the bar than there ever are out on the water. But, Captured on Angler Cam, here's Steve Laws playing and then landing a brilliant 59 centimetre bass. You can see what it meant to him. Amazingly, a couple of hours later, his fishing buddy Ben Worley landed one of exactly the same length.
Gentlemen, the 59 centimetre club. How's that? Well done, Steve. It's a great feeling. Wonderful fish. Gave us both a really good fight, both fish, didn't they? They did, yeah. And we're chuffed to bits. It's a great start to the weekend. So just get pencil picture, Ben. How, how far apart were these two fish in terms of time? Uh, I think about two, three hours, two and a half, three hours. Yeah, so I think Steve had his slack tide, high slack tide, and then uh, mine was about two, three hours later, just as it was starting to move back out. Um, completely out of the blue. Same size, which is unreal, really. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, but it was great. In, a, in an event like this, to get off to that kind of a start, and I mean, we've got two days ahead of us, you know, it's a brilliant feeling, Steve. We're now targeting mackerel, Andy. Are you? Yes. Go for the species trophy. Go for species, yeah. Right. I suppose it remains to be seen whether those two 59 centimetre bass will be good enough to win the competition. One of the greatest things about this, of course, is that the competition restarts every single day. It only takes one big fish to win the whole thing. Now, I've set up two rods, one for bass, one for mullet. I'm going to have a little go. I'm not actually competing in the competition, but always like to have a cast or two. And why wouldn't you? I talked about the tide a little bit earlier on. Today, it's 5.4 metres. So high tide is 5.5 metres. That's, you know, 20 odd feet of water. And low tide is about 10 centimetres. Just take a second to have a little think about that. How much water that is coming in and going out again. That is a lot of water. This little bay over to my right hand side where you can see that wooden structure just about kind of poking into the water is actually one of the best mullet fishing spots anywhere around here. But look at it now, there's no water in it at all. And we're about five minutes after the low water mark. So from now, the tide will start to build. And that's when it starts to get really interesting. So actually, we're here at Church Norton at the perfect time. So let's get out there and have a little go and see what's going on. By Saturday morning, there were lots of anglers eager to learn more about the genius of Colin McLeod. Colin's championed fishing for mullet for more than a decade, and it's developed into an obsession with perhaps the most difficult of fish to catch in UK waters. Mullet are my speciality, um, and there were very few mullet fishers when, when I first began, and there's, there's very few mullet guides around even, even today. So I've had, yeah, I've had quite a few requests to help people, uh, which I was pleased to do and it's wonderful to see the, uh, the way the people themselves develop when they come to the festival as well. You know, their confidence rises um, once they've had some of the guides, you know, Rodney and other guides as well, and the, the bass guides, uh, they, they, they pick up that information, have a little bit of success on the water and you can see their confidence really, really growing. And of course they can take that away with them then, uh, take that home to their, their, the, the marks if they fish locally for themselves. And, One of the toughest areas to master in the salt is casting. The wind off the sea can destroy the confidence of even the most robust freshwater fly angler. To the rescue, one of the finest casters or coaches you've ever seen, in the shape of Charles Jardine. It doesn't matter who you are, me, anyone, at whatever stage of development you are, I think we can always appreciate for, for a pair of eyes that actually can just assimilate or, or take in what you're doing and then just try and alter things, just tiny little things that make, might make a difference. Simplicity is everything, but saltwater anglers are always looking for a way to enhance their adventure. With that in mind, kayak fishing expert Paul Betley was also giving demonstrations. So exciting. <laughs> Just completely out of casting range, look. I don't know if you can see it silhouetted, this fin going across the top like that. Just like, <laughs> that's a big fish. It's either a big fish or two fish. It could be either. And that's, that's why the guys are here. You know, I mean, look at the water I'm standing in. It's what, ankle deep? 
and unbelievably this is the sort of the water that these mullet will feed in. They're coming in for the little shrimps and the worms and the little invertebrates that live in this sort of water and as the tide starts to flood in obviously all the land behind us that's dry at the moment will become exposed and the nutrients that the mullet feed on are in those stones, in among the stones, even little tiny crabs and stuff like that they'll eat. Well, I say they'll eat. They're one of the most frustrating species I've ever fished for, if not the most. You've seen this before with us, I'm sure. They do drive you mad, but it's great fun. I think I need to move a bit. Now, we've seen some fish already this morning. What's been your experience of that? Um, frustrating. Um, <laughs> you, you can see them, they're topping the water. They're obviously feeding in quite large numbers, but do they want to take my fly? No, they don't. It's mullet fishing for you, isn't that it? That is, it is. It's a frustrating, uh, whether it's mullet or bass, it's a frustrating uh, uh, sport. But it's uh, when you catch them, that uh, makes it all, all the more... Uh, uh, you know, interesting for you. So, how yeah. frustrating has your morning been? Um, it hasn't been because I've not been targeting them, but then but I've then found them in front of me. Right. And I've never fished for mullet before, so it was a quick change of flies to something that had red on. Because I remember what Colin said last year: <laughs> if it's got red on it, you've got a chance. So I changed, and I was watching everyone else around me. The guy did catch a small mullet, I heard, just up from me, but. Um, if I was to catch one, I would be over the moon. I'd probably pack up and walk off and just not bother. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably go home a happy man. And you've caught a mullet. Yeah, great. Really chuffed, really chuffed. Was not expecting that, to be honest with you. Like I said, came down with the sea bass, lure and popped on a lure on a mullet fly and uh, yeah, over the moon. What was the fight like? Oh, really good. Five, ten minutes. Uh, gave it a little bit of a challenge because I think my... My leader is a little bit thicker than the ringlet, so every time it popped in, <laughs> you could hear it going, ding, ding. <laughs> Look, I don't want you thinking this mullet fishing lark's easy. No, You've no, done no. well. No, 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 I'm very, very pleased. Very, very pleased. That, that's, that's me good, and I'm going to go and take a little wonder and try and see if I can catch this uh, sea bass. There were a few bass being landed as the water started to move. Here's Charles Gerald at Hailing Island, clearly enjoying his morning. Nice one. Good fish. Really cracking. First fish of the uh, whole festival for me. <laughs> and a day earlier than last year. <laughs> <laughs> a day in about six hours. In. A few moments later, Charles turned cameraman to film Dan Hunwick landing a bass that went 42 centimetres. Along the coast at Pagham, David Bazin was celebrating his second mullet of the morning. It was a 46 centimetre golden grey to follow a 49 centimetre thick lip. You've never seen so many fish. You can't catch. I've had a thousand casts, been ignored a thousand times, just like almost all the guys over my left shoulder too. However, I can reveal something rather special has happened. One of the other anglers who's fishing in a top secret mark somewhere up the harbour, actually in lots of very soft mud called Matt Fender has caught this. That, is a 60 centimetre thick lipped mullet. That is the biggest mullet I have ever seen. It's a PB for Matt. I've just spoken to him on the phone. He is absolutely buzzing. Caught on a blue tagged Romy's sand shrimp. We'll show you the pattern later on. Matt knows this area really well and cannot believe he has caught that incredible fish. That's what this festival's all about. It really is very special indeed.
You know, as beautiful as this incredible part of the world is, Church Norton just doesn't seem to be delivering the goods today. The open coast doesn't seem to be working. And as I've already mentioned, with the expansion in the fishing grounds for the Saltwater Festival, different sorts of venues have now been opened up. I can't begin to tell you just how different they are. See, I told you there was a bit of a contrast. The waters that we're fishing this year take in all sorts. And there, over my left shoulder, is a really fascinating piece of water. Essentially, this is a tidal channel coming off the main river, uh, which goes round the back of Portsmouth. Portsmouth, of course, is an island, a couple of roads going in and out. And this kind of surrounds the whole city. Now, this channel has got a really interesting feature. You can probably see just over there, there's a couple of swans and an island which goes out towards the motorway just over there. And the tide at the moment, we're about two, two hours away from high tide. The tide rushes in through this channel and that area where the two swans are, are just having a little bit of a bathe over there is a pinch point. Now what that essentially means as a bass angler is it's an area that the bass are gonna go through at some point in the tide. To be honest, the way the tide is today, I don't know what time that is but I'm gonna give it a little bit of a go. There are reports of a few other fish being caught elsewhere. Lots of stuff coming off the open coast, which is great. Some fairly decent fish pushing towards that 50 or 60 centimeter mark, challenging the two fish that were on the leaderboard yesterday. Anyway, let's have a little cast and see if we can pull a fish out. Fly fishing doesn't have to take you to some interesting places, you know. I mean, this is not what you would typically expect of a fly angler, is it? You know, busy motorway, it's a weird kind of tidal channel. Just a really strange place to fish. And I can't believe that some stage during this tide, the fish are not gonna pass through with that Coke bottle. <laughs> it's just floating down in the middle of the river. They do go in here. Further down there is a really big sports center with a huge basin of water out the front of it. And I've seen bass in there before and mullet come to that. So the bass go in and the bass come out. And the only way that they can go through is under that bridge, which is over to my left hand side. So at some point during this tide, fish will pass in. Now the question is, of course, whether my fly's in the water at the right time, whether it's the right fly, whether they're hungry, the usual kind of conundrum of problems that we as fly anglers have to solve. Just a very quick word about tactics today, because it's really simple. The bass fishing is not complicated. Ultimately, the thing about bass fishing is to try to find the fish. So I'm using an eight weight outfit. This is a, a, just a nine foot for an eight weight, fitted with a floating line that's got a really heavy head on it. And the reason for that, it's designed to carry heavy flies. And I'm using essentially a clouser, which is a sand eel pattern designed to imitate one of the bass's most favorite food items. It's got a dumbbell head on it, which is made out of tungsten, which allows it to just sink through the layers a little bit. And I can dictate the, oh, if I don't hook the weed that is, if I can dictate the fall through the water by the speed of retrieve. And all I'm trying to do is just prospect. Now, one of the most unusual bits about this particular area, when you're fishing, you try to fish with lures like this on a clock face. So you try to cover the water round in a nice little clock shape. Here I'm able to do it using the lamp posts on the motorway. So I can pick that furthest lamp post. Next cast, I can move to the next lamp post along and so on. Interesting stuff. Fingers crossed we get a fish. You never know. lots of people here who are much better anglers than I am, but none of them are better than this fella. I did tell you that this channel led in from the sea and has fish in it. 
And if you needed any further proof, this seal swimming up and down this channel right next to a busy road is the most extraordinary thing, isn't it? I mean, look at it, happy as anything, pottering about in this water, searching for food. Now, unfortunately, I haven't caught a fish. I expect the seal probably has. Um, it's time to have a little wander around and see what else we can find in the competition grounds. We're about an hour and a half until the end of today's fishing and kind of it's a bit of a race now to, to get enough tide as that enormous amount of water starts to flood in um, to give us a chance to sort of catch some fish. And I've found these two fine gentlemen, Joe Walker and Steve Mio. Joe, some of the environments I've found today to fish in and actually yesterday, in all honesty, fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's one of the reasons why, you know, they choose to have the event here, because within that sort of 20 mile radius of the centre of Hailing Island, you've got pretty much the full gambit. You've got the open beaches, the, the steep drop offs with a strong tide like we're in now. Uh, albeit on a sunny day, you've got to contend with the grockles, but um, <laughs> you know, we're trying not to, uh, to get them on the back cast. And, uh, and then we've got the sort of areas of shallow flats, which Steve and I were exploring earlier. You've got the marshes, salt marshes and creeks. Um, yeah, it's, you know, you've got pretty much a, a, a decent range. Really, I guess, coming from the part of the world that I do in South Wales, the only thing you're missing is a surf beach. You've got the rest covered. Let's we'll see if we can get one of those put in for you next year. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. I can catch some fish there. I mean, how's your day gone? <laughs> it's been really hard. I think, you know, a lot of people are going to come back at the end of the today's session, and I think they're going to, as anglers often do, try and rationalise the reason why the catches were a bit on the low side. And, and probably the logic is going to be down to the size of the tide. It is a monster today. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And I think if you push this volume of water and into a confined space, you're simply thinning all the fish out. You know, it's, it's several feet above what we would normally expect. That's a lot of water. On the plus side, if you can get in the right position, and we're sort of in an ambush point here, you know, when all of that water starts to come out from, from the back of the harbour, what we're hoping is that it's going to create a, a huge rip. It certainly did yesterday here, and that potentially then we could have bass or mackerel or even garfish holding in the, the fast water towards the back of it. It's hilarious, isn't it? There, there's us fly fishing in this environment, all the people on the pier. You know, there's all <laughs> manner of different things going yeah, on Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, mackerel feathers basically as far as I can see there's a lot of mackerel feathers and not a lot of mackerel yeah that's true uh, but it, it's what this is one of those places you know I fished here since I was a kid and you can come down here um, and spend seven hours of nothing and then have 20 minutes of absolute chaos and then the fish are gone again have we got time for that today what the chaos there's, yeah. always, there's always time for the chaos there's plenty of time for chaos I bring chaos. Well, we know this. <laughs> the other thing I was going to ask you, you've been involved in this event pretty much since its inception. Yeah. What do you think about the way it's developed, it's grown? What's your view on that? Do you know what I, what I really like about it now as it's beginning to sort of mature as an event is not only do you see the same people coming back every year and then you get a sort of a, a, a new influx, you know, a new class of people that comes through each year, year groups almost but you're also getting the sort of pass the ball situation from the beginners weekend, which happens uh, you know, a couple of months sooner. So people come in, they cut their teeth in the salt in that, they get the basics and then they take the next step up and they want to be kind of a bit more unfettered and, and unleashed. Um, so they come to this event and they can mix with people who've got the experience uh, and they really benefit from it. So I think it's always a pleasure to see people that you know that you can catch up with, that you can share stories with and see how they've progressed. That's fantastic. But equally, just to welcome new people into the sport as well. So just opportunity to share what we love, isn't it? Very wise words. I'll try. Keep casting. <laughs> I'll try that as well. Well, mate, it's been a tough one, hasn't it? It has been a tough one, yes. The fish are elsewhere to where I am, unfortunately. I've caught a load of fish, but they're all, like if I put them end to end, I probably still wouldn't win it. Again, you've been involved in this for a little while now. Yeah. What's your feeling about the, the Saltwater Festival as a thing? It's a great thing. It's a great thing. It's like a big bunch of like-minded people. We turn up, we have a good laugh. Even if we don't catch, you know, it's still enjoyable. It still beats work. 
it's just it would be nice to get a couple more fish. Some people have had cracking fish. They have today. There's some there's some amazing fish being caught, and that's what keeps us going, you know. day of extremes really hasn't it we got up and experienced the tranquility and beauty of church norton a few fish caught a few stories told we've ended up fishing up river in that most extraordinary of places in the middle of portsmouth right next to the motorway seals going past us never seen anything like that before and the extreme nature of the tide which saw us start the day in completely almost dry conditions then rose to become this ferocious monster that we've seen around us. And now, as the competition day comes to an end here in South Sea, the sea is charging out yet again as it starts to ebb away. Just billions and billions of gallons of water. Amazing day, just amazing. Wish I'd caught a couple of fish. But you know, fly fishing isn't always about catching fish. It's about enjoying the environment. I've certainly done that today. Let's get back to the hotel though, headquarters, and find out who has done what on day two. There was one man who was at the centre of attention back at HQ. Matt Fender, the captor of what would be the fish of a lifetime for anyone. His 60 centimetre thick lip mullet was estimated to have weighed seven pounds. And as the anglers gathered for their evening social, Matt recounted what was a very special experience. Went down this morning, uh, very muddy mark. Um, saw a few fish, didn't see a lot of really hard feeding fish, but um, covered them anyway. And, you know, I was lucky enough to get, get an eat. And there it was, yeah, went off like a train and 10 minutes of absolute mayhem. Um, heart and mouth stuff, a uh, couple of uh, not super long but very strong runs, sort of 10, 15 yard, 20 yard runs um, and yeah eventually got it in the net. They've got Couldn't... so much power that size haven't they? Oh unbelievable, yeah unstoppable and they just dog it out for you know you, you can't stop them you just got to wait until they're done and then you sort of tease them in and got it in the net and yeah couldn't be happier do you know the thing i love is i know you and i spoke on the phone earlier on shortly after you'd caught it you were so excited i was buzzing yeah i was absolutely buzzing that, that i mean i've caught quite a few mullet from this mart and i had a pretty good idea you know i'm local i'm only lived five minutes away i fished it quite a lot last year and i i had a plan um i knew on this big tide we wouldn't get a big window we'd probably you know on a smaller tide you can fish it for an hour two hours um Today, I reckon half an hour tops, you know, from when it started to when it finished, and most of that went by while I was playing this fish, so. Good Lord. Um, but yeah, and, and I think that's probably the biggest fish I've had in that mark, and I, to do it on comp day, uh, couldn't be happier. So Aaron, just looking behind us, you know, here we are on the Saturday night, the social. It's a great buzz, you must be so pleased. It's absolutely fantastic. This is our fourth, uh, fourth festival. Uh, biggest one we've ever done. Um, it's really great to be able to welcome 180 anglers to, to the Orbis Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival this year. Um, the social really is the pinnacle. Um, I think this is what a lot of people live for. They get to relive their catches, uh, talk about what's worked for them today. And I think there's a few people commiserating, but actually today's been fantastic. We've some really impressive catches. And here are a few more of those fish. First, here's David Bazin's 49 centimetre thick lip mullet. Yvette Austin landed this 40 centimetre bass from the westernmost point of the fishing grounds at Leon Solent. And former champion Steve Richards had this 57 centimetre fish from Selzy. It was all to play for on the final day. Well, it's the final morning of the obvious saltwater fly fishing festival. And if you wonder sometimes why us anglers get out of bed at stupid o'clock in the morning, the sunrise this morning was extraordinary. Half past five, six o'clock in the morning, and it's just the most stunning sight you've ever seen. And then you come to this place, we're back at Church Norton, we're back on the mullet hunt again. Um, you know, the, the, the privilege of being in environments like this is what this festival is all about. And 
we've got a few like-minded fools coming here in search of that ultimate fly fishing quarry in the salt water, the mullet. Now today is slightly shortened. We only fish from seven in the morning until two o'clock in the afternoon. And that means that we won't get all of the tide. We've kind of got this as it starts to flood in. Um, but at the other end of the tide, as it starts to flood out again, the competition will be over. So we have about five or six hours ahead of us to do our very best to try to catch a fish or two. Wish us luck. Well, Steve, here we are at Church Norton on the final day of the festival. What a glorious morning. It's absolutely beautiful. It's stunning here. It's one of the reasons we come, of course, and the other one is the dreaded mullet. Yes, uh, I like chasing them around and they would run around me and give me a hell of a time. To me, I reckon kind of fly fishing for mullet is the ultimate angling experience because you certainly go more in hope than expectation, don't you? What have you seen so far this morning? I've seen a few mullet moving and they're just starting to move in behind us at the moment. So I'm um, just waiting for the tide to really get going. Um, and then I think we'll be moving with a chance. Well, the chance is all you can get with these things, uh, isn't it? Yeah, there's no guarantees with mullet. <laughs> None at all. You might wonder why we keep coming back to try and catch a fish which is so difficult to catch. Well, to be honest, that's part of the fun of it, is that sort of shared experience of the craziness of mullet fishing. Um, the interesting thing also here is that it's such a brotherhood around it. I've never experienced it in any other area of fly fishing or any other type of fishing, to be honest, where shared experiences and shared sort of frustrations are passed around the entire group. And there's 180 of us here this weekend kind of experiencing the same thing. The one thing that has happened, which I love, is that people share fly patterns, you know, things that work. Um, so it's such a, a kind of, I suppose, fairly new science pioneered by Colin McLeod, who has found so many different ways to kind of experience trying to catch these fish. And Colin this year has had an awful lot of, of success with one particular fly, which ironically was the one that Matt caught that huge thick lip with yesterday. That's called the Blue Romy's Sand Shrimp. And here is a little version of how you tie it.
There is one of the anglers here at Church Norton, Lewis Clark, making a long walk back to the shore with a very special prize in his net. I get the feeling that that is a decent sized mullet. Here's Lewis going through the measuring, wow, that's a big fish, going through the measuring process. Looks like a thick lip. So this is the measuring process all the anglers have to go through. So you put it on a measuring tape and take a photograph and send it back to headquarters. And that fish looks like it's gone over 50. So that's a massive fish. And this, to be honest, as an angler is the best bit. Having caught a fantastic prize like that, Lewis Clark sees it swim away. What a fantastic sight. Now then, Lewis, that was a fine sight. Here we are at Church Norton. Fabulous. In, you know, as I've said all morning, in hope more than expectation. <laughs> and, and you've finally done what we all want to do. Congratulations. Well, I was very lucky. I've read a lot of Colin's books and he's done the workshops and everything like that. I've, I've really owe a lot of it to him, to be perfectly honest, rather than me. And I've missed a lot of fish as well today by not strip striking. So I've been very lucky to be in the right place. And I had a beautiful bass earlier as well on one of the mullet flies. So it's just been one of those lucky days, to be honest. <laughs> I've been seeing lots of feeding groups and the more competitive the groups have got, then I've cast to those and tried to pinpoint those. And then as the water has come in, I've sort of followed back. Back. back on the masterclass trail and by Sunday morning Colin's expertise fueled by the dreams of those wanting to emulate Matt Fender's incredible capture on the Saturday was starting to pay off. Here's Gary Brazier, a man who's no mullet novice, hooked into a fish which grabbed his fly just as the Sunday morning session was starting to come to a close. Under the watchful eye of Colin and a decent crowd that had gathered to see, it was proof with mullet fishing you can never afford to give up. Saw a lot of fish earlier in the tide, uh, covered quite a few golden grey mullet, but uh, had one good take but missed it. And then uh, uh, my experience, I normally find as the water gets deeper it's very difficult, so I'd kind of almost given up. And I saw Colin McLeod, we were having a uh, chat like we normally do, and we saw a couple of fish splashing around just offshore and uh, Colin said well you should have a go at that and I thought well okay I just saw a fish coming out of the shallows and swimming outwards and I put the fly just in front of it and whack took the dropper fly which I was quite surprised at but it was a nice golden grey uh, was it 46 centimetres uh, caught it on a uh, little blue roamy shrimp with brown feelers it was on the, caught on the dropper um, gave a very good fight I've been on this game for five years now and I'm learning that uh, yes, you never know when you're going to catch fish. Elsewhere, here's David Bazin again, fresh from catching two mullet on Saturday with a magnificent 50 centimetre thick lip which grabbed his fly on Sunday morning. Ben Worley, captor of a 59 centimetre bass that was jointly holding the lead had one a centimetre smaller as the final day was drawing to a close. And here's John Seeley with a 47 centimetre bass caught and released from the beach at Hailing Island. The tide was moving in. Time to leave the fishing to the real experts and head back to get the results. So after three days of casting at shadows and hoping for a take, the winners who achieved their saltwater fly fishing dreams were announced. Lewis Clark claimed the multi-species prize for bass, mullet and a horse mackerel. The bass prize was shared between Steve Laws and Ben Worley. And the mullet prize went to Matt Fender. I think it's fair to say that this year's festival hasn't been easy. The fishing has been great when it's gone right for you, but there have been areas where people have struggled. That, in essence, is saltwater fly fishing. The challenges are there, and when you get the solution, it's so, so satisfying. To me, though, there's one story from this weekend which is fairly interesting as someone who wants to catch big mullet, and that is the fly that's been used to catch most of the big fish this weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, the fly that did it all, the blue Romy's shrimp. 